Good evening, and welcome to Great Decisions. So good to see people. Whoops. Oh, <laughs> I'm starting the program here, I guess. Um, good to see all of you. Um, I'm surprised at the empty chairs. So let me say this right now. If you or someone you know has made a reservation and cannot get here, please, please, please call the library because we have a waiting list of 15 people who could be here tonight and are not. In fact, we turned away two people, <clears throat> uh, one on the waiting list. And so if you cannot be here, please let us know so we can arrange for an alternative to be here. <clears throat> Okay, um, our presenter this evening is Daniel Stoll, who has his doctorate from the University of Missouri. He's the Associate Dean for Global Affairs at St. Norbert's. As Associate Dean, he provides oversight and direction for all of the activities within the Center for Global Engagement, including study programs abroad, international student recruitment, and the English as a Second Language Institute. During his career, he has worked in both the foreign policy community as well as higher education. Before coming to St. Norbert, he had several positions at Georgetown University and at the Georgetown's campus in Doha. At the University of Missouri, Kansas City, he served as director for international academics programs as well as deputy to the chancellor. As a member of the U.S. Foreign Service, Dr. Stoll had postings to the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, the U.S. Consulate Gen General in Johannesburg, and in the Near East Bureau of the U.S. Department of State. While with the Foreign Service, he received three mer meritorious honor awards. His research focuses on issues of water and food security in the Middle East, as well as International Higher Education Administration. He is co-author of International Conflict Over Water Resources in Himalayan Asia, as well as the Politics of Scarcity, Water in the Middle East. He has also contributed chapters to volumes on higher education in the Middle East and on relations between Africa and the Arab Gulf states. So please welcome Dr. Stoll, who will talk about the future of the Persian Gulf security. Thank you so much for the invitation to be with you tonight. And I think this is probably one of the most timely topics we could be discussing in your lecture series, given everything that's been happening in the Persian Gulf, by extension, Afghanistan. We'll talk on, about some of that later in the presentation. But right now, what I thought I would like to do is um, give a brief overview of the region. I want to make certain we're all familiar with the terms that we're going to be discussing. Uh, talk a bit about the history. This is not going back, you know, to uh, Ottoman times, don't worry. But I think we need to have some sort of grounding in 19th, uh, 20th, 21st century history. And then um, looking at what U.S. strategic interests are in this region and have a conversation about what that portends for the uh, country moving forward. Um, Geographically, again, we're talking about the countries of Bahrain, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. I've intentionally highlighted Iran in a different color because we're going to come back to that um, in just a moment. But um, while we're going to talk about those specific countries in, in this talk tonight, we're also going to, at times, look beyond into the uh, Middle East and North Africa region, the MENA, MENA region as well. Um, important to get a sense of what the population is like in this uh, part of the world. And as you see, we have got a population spread from you know, um, 85 million for Iran down to 1.26 million for Bahrain. Um, 
the numbers are important, but so is the fact that we're talking about an increasingly young population. Um, that's going to figure into some of our conversation later on about the pressures put on the governments in these regions. But I've given you the US at the bottom just by basis of comparison. Um, and when you look at what that, for example, annual increase is, you see the United States pretty much at replacement value, what they call, demographers will call replacement value. Um, countries, though, like Oman, Bahrain, others, much higher population, and again, that's going to exert some pressures on the governments in the region, and we'll look at that um, later on. So we've got the geography, we've got population. Inevitably, if we're going to talk about the Persian Gulf, we have to talk about oil and to some extent natural gas. Tonight we're just going to talk about oil. This is a region that has some of the world's largest reserves. And as you can see, Saudi Arabia by far eclipses most of its neighbors. Uh, Bahrain really has, no longer has any appreciable oil, so it's listed as zero. Somewhere you find the other countries. But um, again, some of the largest reserves available uh, to the global energy markets, obviously a source of incredible wealth, as well as a source of tension. Um, access to those reserves, uh, oil and gas uh, reserves don't neatly fall within geographic boundaries. So. Qatar and Iran share a very large natural gas field. Um, if you remember the first Gulf War, Saddam claiming that um, Kuwait was extracting oil from its side of the border. So these are uh, sources of, again, considerable wealth, but also um, tension. This oil is of interest to global energy markets. 80% um, of the oil from the Gulf goes to Asia. Uh, Japan and China in particular get the bulk of their petroleum from this part of the world. In 2018, over 21 billion barrels a day pass through the Gulf. 21 billion bar barrels of oil a day in 2018. Um, natural gas is also uh, very important. And again, we're talking about some of the largest reserves of natural gas. In fact, Qatar and China just uh, inked a deal for 3.5 million metric tons of liquefied natural gas. That will be shipped over the next 15 years. But it's an indication, again, of just how important the um, petroleum and, and reserve, uh, natural gas reserves are for not only this region, but global energy markets. So a little bit of history. As I said, we need to solve, uh, set some context. And before we can really look at what the United States has been doing in the region, I think we need to examine what was happening at the turn of the 20th century. 19th and 20th century. Again, not trying to give a definitive history lesson, but I think it's important to understand some of uh, the events at this period that then set the stage for what's happening currently. Um, we're talking about uh, rapidly diminishing before World War I, rapidly diminishing Ottoman Empire that had been in ascendancy for several hundred years. Um, we see as the Ottoman Empire receding in influence, Britain, France in particular, coming into the region. Um, once the Suez Canal was built in Egypt in the 19th century, the region took on even more strategic importance because the Suez guaranteed fast, efficient uh, access from Britain to its uh, colonies in the east, particularly India. And this region becomes important for those transit routes uh, initially, again, protecting British imperial interests, but particularly India. There was also this desire to restrain external influences, Britain, France, looking at Russia at the time, uh, first you know, Tsarist Russia, later Soviet Union, trying to minimize the role Russia plays in that region. But really, we're talking about um, an importance in transportation. That changed, however, in 19, um, it changed in 1911. 
And what ended up happening at that point was a fellow by the name of Winston Churchill, not yet prime minister, but at the time first Lord of the Admiralty. And he decided he was going to convert the British Navy from coal to oil. Sounds pretty non-controversial, sounds pretty straightforward. But what that essentially was, uh, the impetus for that uh, decision was an increasing competition between Britain and Germany in the build-up to World War I. Germany's navy becoming increasingly powerful, increasingly fast. And one way that Churchill decided Britain could compete was by converting the British Navy to oil. Oil-powered ships generally faster. They don't require very lengthy recalling stations and, and time you know, recalling. And so he made that decision. And he made it in part because there was already exploration going on in Iran, what is now Iran, um, in the oil reserves. And in 1908, a tremendous amount of oil was discovered in, in Iran. And that led to Churchill's decision that here was a large, readily developed and exported source of oil. We're going to convert the Navy to oil from, from coal. That really puts into play this emphasis that we continue to see to this day of reliance on the region for its hydrocarbons. Um, they make the the, uh, the conversion. Um, the United, uh, I'm sorry, the um, Britain decides it has to have access to those those reserves. Um, it ends up purchasing uh, the equivalent of about 51 percent of the Anglo-Iranian oil company. So they were locking in that uh, the, uh, that reserve, and they were making certain that Britain would have access to that region and, and its oil. So that kind of takes us up to World War II. I know we're galloping along here, but I think it's important. And after the war, we begin to see an awful lot of change, an awful lot of instability that resulted from the end of the Second World War. Um, Britain, at this point, uh, is really struggling to cope with the demands of a diminishing empire. Its imperial obligations are really causing it to uh, struggle and to strain. Um, one reason why, 1947, India becomes independent. Britain decided it needed to sever that tie as a result of uh, India no longer being the uh, jewel in the crown, so to speak. Um, the region wasn't as important uh, for transportation, although the Suez still had some significance. Um, Israel becomes independent. As a result, we start seeing a number of other independence movements. That Anglo-Iranian oil company gets nationalized by the Iranian government. Um, and we see in this uh, post-war period, again, a diminishing role for the UK in this region. And it was very difficult for the British government to kind of accept this change. And so at the one hand, they wanted to kind of offload these obligations of empire. They still wanted to maintain some sort of influence. And so in 1956, they make the decision that they're going to invade Egypt because during the Suez Crisis, if you remember your history, uh, Egyptian President Kamal Abdel Nasser decides he's going to nationalize the Suez uh, Canal, take it under Egyptian control. And that was just a little too much for France and Britain to accept. So they launched this invasion. It's um, eventually stopped in, in large part because of US intervention. Dwight Eisenhower really put his foot down and imp uh, imposed economic sanctions, froze British assets. And in the end, they had to pull back, Britain and France pulled back, but it was yet another diminution, another decrease in the influence that Britain had in the region at the time. And then by 1971, all these countries like Bahrain, Kuwait, Qatar, United Emirates, 
that weren't perhaps formally part of the empire, but still very much influenced by the British Empire, declared independence. And so we see Britain pulling back at an increasingly faster pace. That sets the stage for US involvement. And while we have tended to think of US as always involved in the Middle East, always a supplier of arms, always a supplier of support for Israel, uh, we didn't step in completely uh, to fill the breach left by Britain. This was a, an involvement that evolved over time. And even though we really have had very active engagement since I would say the um, early to mid 1970s, and we've seen multiple US administrations in that time period, I would argue that our strategic interests in the Middle East as a, you know, as a broad region, but also the Gulf, have pretty much stayed the same through successive administrations and over successive decades. Um, first and foremost, we have always placed considerable value and importance on ensuring that the region's oil and gas reserves are produced effectively, efficiently, and oil and gas is exported without any kind of impediment or hindrance. Even when we have, as we have recently stepped back and become a, 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 an exporter of petroleum, uh, we still rely on this region's oil and gas to ensure a stable global energy uh, market. And that really, that kind of focus on energy, that focus on oil and gas, really has stayed consistent through multiple administrations up until, up until right now. Um, support for Israel has also been a fairly consistent strategic imperative for the United States. Um, granted, Truman's recognition of uh, Israeli independence in 1948 was very controversial, at least within his administration. Secretary of State Marshall even threatened to resign if Truman recognized Israel, did not think it was the best thing to do. And so for the first uh, couple of decades of Israel's existence, the United States really wasn't the ally that we think of US-Israel today. But even, even then, we, we saw ourselves as having an important stake in Israel's stability, in Israel's security. And that sort of concern has remained, again, present up until the, the current um, administration. And it probably will not go away. Um, and now we have very close ties with Israel, intelligence sharing. Um, uh, we see Israel's military as a kind of counterbalance to some Arab armies in, in the area, very strong cultural, economic, um, um, social ties. And so Israel's security remains a very uh, dominant concern for us. We've had this desire to, to counter or somehow deal with what we think might be external threats to the region. For a long time during the Cold War, we really did not want to see the Soviet Union exerting any influence in, in this part of the world. We were very nervous when, again, Egypt under Gamal Abdel Nasser started making a rapprochement, creating a rapprochement with the Soviet Union, buying Soviet weaponry, um, helping uh, the Soviets helping build an uh, Aswan Dam. So the United States has been worried about what it can see, uh, con uh, considers kind of malign or less than helpful influences exerted on the region from external players. And even today, I would say that we're concerned to some degree with Russian interference in the region. Russia is certainly not playing a very helpful role in places like Syria. And so while maybe that concern about external threats or influences has diminished, there still is a sense that we need to be careful who's getting involved and who is trying to have some sort of influence. Um, we've always had very strong, uh, a very strong interest in protecting 
what we think are our allies in the region. Increasingly Jordan, the Gulf monarchies, we've mentioned Israel already, but we have seen uh, through the years successive administrations focused on how can we support friends in the region, whether it's Israel or some of the Arab states. And that has pretty much consist, uh, stayed consistent over multiple administrations. And then, um, just like we were worried about, say, state actors, the Soviet Union, Russia, we've been very focused on what are called non-state actors. Hamas, PLO, ISIS, Islamic State. Um, political movements, perhaps Islamic fundamentalist movements, that um, tend to be, or we think tend to be, sources of instability for our friends in the region. They might be affiliated with um, you know, Shia Iran. They might be, um, at the, as the PLO was initially, very focused on destroying the state of Israel. But regardless of their, their kind of motivation, regardless of their um, agenda, actors that we feel are really posing threats to our economic interests, our allies, our political interests, and we're going to have to deal with those. So these kind of strategic interests, again, really have stayed fairly consistent since particularly the 1960s up until the present time. How has the United States tended to respond then? So um, I would say that while our interests have tended to stay the same, um, you'll see over successive US administrations uh, a change in foreign policy approaches, a change in the tools used to advance or protect those interests. And you see a variety of different ways that the United States over time has um, responded to threats or the desire to protect its interests. Uh, we'll talk in a bit about military assets. Um, that's been a particularly significant role in how we are presented in the region. Um, we've, over the years, used our membership in international organizations to protect or advance our interests. If you're familiar with the number of times the United States has used its veto in the Security Council at the United Nations to counter resolutions that are, say, anti-Israel or anti-another one of our uh, allies in the region. It's a demonstration, again, of a foreign policy tool that we have tended to use um, to protect our interests. Um, we have, at times, invested a lot of money in terms of economic assistance. Uh, that's particularly true for Israel, Jordan, to some extent, Egypt, well, to a considerable extent, Egypt, actually. Um, perhaps less so in the states in the Gulf, but the MENA region generally, we have spent a lot of money and invested a lot of resources um, in economic assistance. And then, of course, they, we have sought closer ties, particularly with the Gulf monarchies, and we'll talk about those in just a minute, but have really focused on how can we develop economic ties, particularly with the oil and gas industry. Um, we have increasingly sold sophisticated weaponry to the Gulf monarchies. Uh, we've positioned U.S. military assets in the region, and we'll be talking about those. And so over time, the countries, uh, the Arab uh, countries in the Gulf, have really seen a uh, renewed focus by successive administrations on improving those relationships. Military sales, probably one of the most obvious ways that we have tried to influence or um, prop up our, our allies. Um, I've included Iran there because, as I said earlier, they're part of the Persian Gulf, but we haven't sold weaponry to the Iranians since 1979. But hasn't stopped the Saudis, hasn't stopped many other countries from purchasing sizable amounts uh, of weaponry. And that continues until this day. Um, 
This figure is important not only because of just the dollar value associated with the weapons themselves, but with what are called downstream uh, associated costs. So when you buy that sophisticated missile package, when you buy that F-15, when you buy those weapon systems, they have to be maintained. People have to be trained how to use them. They'll have to have upgrades at some point. And so when a country invests in these systems, like particularly sophisticated fighter systems or missile systems, that's a, that's a long-term commitment. And so the initial price tag of the system is significant, but it's also then what happens years from there, again, in terms of training, in terms of upgrades. And so these sales have economic value immediately, but also in the long term. Um, increasingly, we are seeing the United States um, demonstrate its interest in the region, try to influence events in the region by positioning assets, military assets, in, in countries in the Persian Gulf. And I've given you here just a, a kind of a taste of what some of this might look like. There's still a much more exhaustive list that we have. But for example, Saudi Arabia, after the um, first Gulf War, allowed the positioning of a sizable amount of US military personnel in the kingdom. That changed over time. They asked us to leave. Qatar raised its hand and said, we'd like to have, have you come. And so El Adeid Air Base has been built. Um, forward headquarters for the US Central Command. Um, they're increasingly buying weaponry as well from us. In fact, uh, they've purchased 36 F-15 fighters. It's around $6.2 billion worth of, of military equipment. Um, and that's just Qatar. Bahrain, very important as the base for the US uh, Fifth Fleet. We also have in the Emirates uh, positioning of military personnel. And though in Iraq we have down, uh, drawn down considerably with our assets there, we still have around 2,000, 2,500 uh, personnel in that country. All told, we have somewhere around 50, 55,000 military personnel in the Middle East region, a lot of them stationed in this particular part of, um, of, of that area. Why is this important? Why are those systems important? Um, they're first of all seen as very uh, uh, visible, very physical demonstrations of U.S. support for the governments in this area. We are selling them this weapon we, weapon, weaponry. We're positioning these bases as a sign of our commitment to their stability. Um, these military bases, though, are also important for a broader geopolitical reason, and that is they allow the United States to project power, project influence, outside the region. This is increasingly important now that we have pulled out of Afghanistan, but from these bases in the Persian Gulf, the United States military can run operations, again, project influence in a wide area around the Persian Gulf. And so they're important for the immediate kind of protection they give, if you will, to some of our allies in the region. They also allow us, though, to project that influence. And this is becoming increasingly important in the minds of many US foreign policymakers as they seek, for example, to counter China's Belt and Road Initiative. That longstanding development initiative that China has putting economic uh, d assets in place around the world, and increasingly it's in places like the Red Sea, East Africa, the Horn of Africa. And so now we have China, which um, is, is really flexing its muscles in a way that the United States finds unhelpful. And so having these assets on the ground in uh, the Gulf gives US policymakers another way of responding. So what is going on currently 
with the security environment today. We've kind of done this quick uh, rush through history in the region. What's happening today now? I would say that um, despite decades of investment, involvement, arms sales, economic commitment, the region is actually quite precarious, quite unstable. Um, while we have managed to help prop up allies in the region like the El Saud family, like our um, like the royal families in Qatar, Emirates, um, Bahrain, we are looking at a part of the world that is really quite unstable. And this is going to get us back to some of our first conversations when we talked about population and some of those issues. So for example, Iraq. Um, as you know, we had committed a tremendous amount of time, treasure, manpower to that country. And yet it continues to be a country divided by sectarian uh, tensions. Tremendous division between Sunni and Shia Muslims. Um, this was really exacerbated under the regime of Saddam Hussein. And we see that playing out even today. And we'll talk about Iran's influence in just a moment. But even without Iranian meddling in, in Iraq, we would see tremendous tension among communities within that country. Even though uh, Iraq has got tremendous oil revenues, if you remember that slide several back, you had Saudi Arabia, quite substantial, but then Iran and Iraq, tremendous assets. And yet those assets have really not been used to improve conditions to any great extent in that country. Um, issues of corruption, but also issues of a kind of decrepit, antiquated infrastructure for the oil and gas industry. If you recall, the United States led a number of sanctions regimes to be imposed on Iraq, particularly under Saddam Hussein. And one of the impacts of those regimes, those sanctions imposed on the government, was that there wasn't the material, there wasn't the expertise uh, that was needed to keep the oil and gas infrastructure up to date. And so the country today is kind of trying to play catch up with how it can develop and export its oil. Um, you have Iraq, you have tension between Qatar, and some of its neighbors. In 2017, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, the Emirates um, decided, and Egypt decided that they were basically going to impose an embargo on their fellow Arab country, in part because they thought the Qatari royal family was getting too close to Iran. Um, if you're familiar with Al Jazeera, the news channel, they uh, felt that Al Jazeera was running stories that were very critical of particularly the Saudi royal family and others that they didn't like. Um, they also thought that the, that the Qatari royal family was developing too close of a tie with Iran and the, the religious leaders there. And so they thought they would teach Qatar a lesson. They imposed an embargo. They cut off land. They refused to let uh, land um, crossings. They refused to let um, airplanes fly through their airspace to get to Qatar. And for a number of years, a couple of years, that embargo really pinched. The, the Qataris have responded. They've kind of reconfigured a lot of their systems. Their, um, uh, they figured out new ways of importing uh, food. It's gotten to the point now where there's, I think, kind of begrudging acceptance that maybe Qatar will be allowed to do some of these things. And you're seeing a, a restoration of ties between Qatar and these other countries. But it's a source of tension, again, still, uh, within the region. And then increasingly, a lot of these countries are facing tremendous internal problems. And here we're going to get back to that uh, slide about the population. Not only in many of these countries is the population expanding at a far greater rate than many other countries in the world, but it's an increasingly young population. And these are people who really want greater economic freedom. They want greater political say in their government. They look at what they consider to be 
corrupt elites siphoning off the wealth of the country and not using it for the development of the country itself. And so there's this tremendous pressure building up in a lot of the countries um, aimed at criticism of and dissatisfaction with the ruling elites. So they're all, in many ways, finding um, you know, uh, expression politically uh, against the, the ruling elites. And then we still have these tremendous sectarian divides within the region and many of the countries. So Bahrain, although the royal family is Sunni, the vast majority of Bahrainis are Shia to you know, expressions of Islam that really do not get along very well. Saudi Arabia, very concerned about its Shia minority particularly since many of the Shia live in the predominantly oil production area of the country. And so that Sunni-Shia divide plays out in, in a number of ways internally, but also in terms of probably one of the most important uh, relationships in the, in the Gulf, and that is the one between Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, and Iran. Um, this is really probably one of the, the defining relationships in the Gulf. It's been that way since 1979 in the Iranian Revolution. It's become increasingly pronounced. And it is, in some ways, at least the governments themselves perceive this as an existential threat that on the part of the Saudis, they look to Iran, it's a Shia, it's a Persian country, its government says that the only true government should be based with Shia religious uh, leaders. That's a legitimate government. Uh, they look at the uh, Iranian government as a threat, and we'll talk about it in just a minute, how they threaten Saudi Arabia. Iran says the same thing about Saudi. Um, they're trying to undermine um, the Islamic Republic of, of Iran. The Saudis are behind um, any number of attempts to destabilize the region. And you see this tension, again, primarily between the Emirates and Saudi on one hand, and Iran on another. You see that tension play out in a couple of different ways. Um, Iran, for example, very much tries to use proxies to um, influence what's happening in its neighbors. So it will support uh, Shia groups in Yemen. It'll sh support Shia groups in Iraq. It looks to Bahrain to do the same thing. And they try to use those proxies to exert influence, even if it's just to kind of create instability and indecision on the part of the, uh, the Arab countries. Um, this is one of the reasons, again, why um, Egypt, Bahrain, the Emirates, and Saudi Arabia were so upset with Qatar. They thought that Qatar was basically, in many ways, supporting what they thought was a very real existential threat, and they had to control what was happening in Qatar in order to minimize that threat. Um, Saudis, again, on the other hand, regard Iran as an existential threat, particularly to the royal family. Um, they have regarded the Iranians as, as a source of instability in the region since the night, late 1970s when Ayatollah Khomeini came into power. And so you have set up in the region this, this tension, this um, you know, um, conflict between two very different uh, systems of government, two very different expressions of Islam. And so as I said earlier, Iran particularly has been using uh, proxies to kind of get at, undermine, influence what's happening in the region. And we're familiar again with the Yemeni civil war. We're familiar with some of the um, support that Iran has given Hezbollah. Um, Iraq, it is definitely 
a, um, a way of influencing the region that's difficult for Saudi and other Arab uh, countries to counter, and so regarded by the Iranians as very effective. In addition, though, to this use of proxies, this kind of low-level um, way of influencing, Iran has, has really been investing, if you will, in, in a couple of very concrete um, foreign policy tools that pose an equally dire threat to the Saudis and the other Arab states. One is their intention to expand nuclear, uh, their nuclear program, and the other is developing their own kind of ballistic missile system. They've used the ballistic system already to target um, resources in Saudi Arabia, particularly Aramco, the Saudi oil company. They could use the ballistic missile system to attack other assets, such as US military bases there. So between the, the nuclear program as well as the, um, the ballistic missile system, Iran seems to be posing quite a threat to the region. And so you have this tension, and I wanted to kind of refer to um, Mohammed bin Salman just as an example of how this plays out on the Saudi side. Um, not going to give you a history about the crown prince, but as we're all familiar, uh, probably by now, highly influential in the kingdom. In many ways, he is seen as the face of Saudi uh, policy, particularly when it comes to um, Iran. And while his rise to power has been pretty ruthless, we think of Khashoggi and the things he's done to stifle um, opposition, certainly in the last administration, uh, the, the uh, Donald Trump administration, MBS, he's kind of known by his initials, MBS was seen as a, as a real ally, as, as a real asset to US foreign policy. In fact, in a way, it's almost hearkening back to when uh, Richard Nixon looked to Iran and Saudi Arabia to protect US interests in the region. Under the Donald Trump administration, it, in a way, it was almost Israel and Saudi Arabia, a kind of return to that so-called twin, uh, twin pillar approach. Um, regardless, uh, Mohammed bin Salman has made it pretty clear. He uh, regards Iran as a direct threat, as an existential threat, and he will do everything possible to counter that. Within the last couple of weeks, we have seen a slight easing of tension between Saudi and Iran. There's starting to be some sort of um, discussion taking place, low-level discussions, but we'll have to see how that plays out. Right now, that still, however, remains one of the primary um, relationships, and it's not a very good one, in the Gulf. So. Where does this leave the United States? And I think um, one thing that I'm going to try to leave you with you now, and then we'll get to some questions, is the fact that, again, our interest in the region might change slightly in terms of importance, but they are still going to remain what they have been for the last several decades. Access to unimpeded energy flows, Israel security, we want to try to minimize uh, forces of instability, whether they're state actors or non-state actors. And we look to protecting the stability of our allies in the region. How we advance those interests, though, is really going to be dependent on, I think, three questions. One will be, what is the fallout from our pullout in Afghanistan? What are the long-term ramifications of the events in August and September? Um, certainly, the military bases that we have in that region are even more important because, as I said, now no longer do we have Bagram Air Force Base and other assets in Afghanistan. Our military presence is concentrated, at least in this region, in, the, in those countries. So those assets are going to be important. But I think there's a real question about um, what is the US willingness to commit to security of these countries in the, in the Gulf. As recently as last week, the foreign minister of the United Arab Emirates basically said um, it's wait and see 
for what the United States is willing to do and capable of doing. The concern many of the Arab monarchies have now uh, about US uh, reliability has been shaken by what happened in Afghanistan. Um, second question that we're going to have to answer as policymakers is, is this set of issues, security for Israel, oil, uh, supporting our allies, going to be as important as other foreign policy challenges? U.S. relations with China. What's happening in Europe because of Vladimir Putin? Uh, we know Barack Obama had called for this pivot to Asia. That has the Gulf monarchies really worried. And they're wondering if increasingly US attention is going to be taken away from the Gulf and put on some of these other areas. Finally, there's going to be a question, and this is, again, one that has to be answered by American leaders and the American people. And that is, what is the role the United States should play in the global system? Are we going to have kind of the role of peace protector? Are we going to be seen as the global policeman? Are we going to be seen as a dominant economic power? Or are we going to turn within? Are we going to focus more on domestic issues and not spend as much time on foreign policy? That is a really difficult conversation that's been happening the last couple of years. I don't see it diminishing anytime soon. And that question is probably going to be the most important one for what United States policy will be towards the Gulf in the next, say, two to four years. I want to stop now, have some time for questions. And thank you again for coming and being part of this uh, discussion. Thank you. Microphone. Okay. Here, there's one. No, this one. Oh, okay. Oh, no, you got it there. Yep. Excuse me. Okay. So, if you have a question, raise your hand and I'll bring you the mic. Actually, I got two questions. Okay. I, I watched CNN. <laughs> okay. I got the mic. Okay. You might have had this on there, but I really have a hard time seeing it. Okay. okay. So, let's go back. You got Obviously, 911, big thing, a very big. You got uh, World War II, Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. then sinking Lusitania. What was the importance in 1954 when we got the Shah of Iran elected? Uh, so the. Um, uh, so the overthrow of uh, Mossadegh. Uh, and we installed the Shah. That was, yeah, 1953. 53. Yeah. Um, two things primarily. Concern on the part of Britain and the United States that Mossadegh, the prime minister, was seen as too pro-Soviet, uh, was seen as too willing to partner with the Soviet Union. And that would have been bad enough, but then again, Iran had these tremendous oil assets. And um, concern that by pitching the country towards the Soviet Union, access to that oil would be jeopardized. So I would say there were probably two factors. Two factors. Yeah. But the interest in oil was uh, paramount. I, well, again, I would say oil and reducing inf influence of, Saudi, um, of the Soviet Union. I mean, this was, at the same time, um, if you're familiar with the Baghdad Pact, um, it was a series of, it was a, an alignment of countries. If you can kind of imagine Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, you know, there was literally an attempt through the Baghdad Pact to create a physical barrier between the Soviet Union and the Middle East, uh, the rest of the Gulf. So this was the height of the Cold War. Um, do not diminish the fear, the concern that policymakers in Western Europe and the United States had for expanding Soviet influence. And when it, the perception was that Mossadegh was becoming increasingly friendlier towards the Soviet Union, that was very worrisome to uh, policymakers. And you mentioned uh, President Truman and Marshall, who was almost resigned over the acceptance of Israel. 
Uh, the, uh, yeah, Marshall and many was of he... Truman's com cabinet thought that recognizing Israel would jeopardize U.S. interests with other Arab states, particularly Saudi Arabia. Was this the same Marshall from the Marshall Plan? Yeah. And the same Marshall? General of, Marshall. Of an owner of a football team? Uh, I don't know if he ever owned a so football team. So was he... And no, I don't think so. At Westport grad, West Point graduate, he was okay. not, ranking not American same commander. One. So no, but he was in World War II. You know, was he anti-Jewish? No, I think the idea was by recognizing Israel, a small country that was already um, in very tense relationship with its neighbors the United States was actually going to jeopardize its other strategic re, uh, interests in the region. I don't think anyone has ever accused the general of being anti-Semitic. Okay. Um, I, I mean, there could be an element on the part of some of Truman's advisors, but I think what they were really focused on also was the geopolitical implications of recognizing this very, very small state and the jeopardy it could pose to broader uh, relationships. Okay. Right. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Uh, professor, you mentioned uh, uh, on several times about the rapid growth of population in this area mm -hmm. and how that could be a destabilizing influence. Mm -hmm. and I wonder what are the factors that would what what are the factors that causes that to be decentralizing? Destabilizing. Yeah. Again, I, there's this growing pressure on the part of um, an expanding population to have access to greater economic um, benefit, a desire to participate in, in government. Um, traditionally, what these governments have done to kind of tap down dissent, to keep people happy, is spend money on social services. So probably don't have to pay for utilities. You probably don't have to pay for the water or electricity you consume. We're going to give you free medical care. Um, we'll possibly even give you land. Now, just be quiet. You've gotten that. So don't, don't try to get involved with politics, because that's the purview of my family. So that's much more difficult to do, however, as that population expands. As that younger population looks around and says, you know, what we're experiencing here is not what's happening in just about any other part of the world, Western Europe, the United States, Latin America. We kind of want some of that. We want to be able to say what happens in our in our country. We want to say have some say in government. It's one of the reasons why last uh, last two weeks, I'm trying to remember now, within the last two weeks, Qatar for the first time had elections for what it called the Shura Council, a consultative council. The first time Qataris were allowed to vote for some kind of elected representation. So it's, it's not a parliament. Uh, I think it's only around 50 or 60 members. Um, and this body will not be allowed to say anything about defense, foreign policy, or the economy. But they will weigh in on everything else. Um, so it's, it's an attempt by the family to say, OK, we're going to give you a little bit of say here. But again, we're controlling most of the levers of power. That's increasingly difficult to maintain if the population expands and there are more and more people demanding certain social, economic, or political benefits. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I got a job with Aramco in 1997. Okay. So there's a big move for moving from oil to health care in Saudi Arabia, making mm -hmm. that a health care center. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about that? Because I don't know what it's done since then. Um, 
So I, I think in, in large part, all of these countries um, are trying to figure out how they diversify their economy. Um, if we, okay, so again, other than Bahrain, uh, which really has no oil any longer, even Oman with very limited reserves still relies to a considerable extent on the sale of oil. So they watch very closely as that price per barrel ticks up and they base, you know, three year, four year uh, budgets on a, on a certain level. Um, even Saudi Arabia with 266 billion barrels in reserves uh, at some point knows it's going to run out. But also it's, it's heavily dependent on one source of income. And so if there's a global economic crash or you know, something affects global energy markets, that has a direct impact. So all of these countries, but particularly um, Qatar, the Emirates, Saudi Arabia, are trying to figure out how could we you know, basically generate other f forms of income. So Saudi Arabia, believe it or not, is thinking that they're going to develop a tourism industry primarily for fellow Muslims. Um, still kind of difficult to get a visa if you're not, you know, Arab Muslim or, you know, a, a Muslim from, say, Malaysia. But they are looking at develop, and there are some incredibly important, you know, archaeological sites, historical sites in the country. And that's, that's not unreasonable to think. Um, but again, is tourism going to be able to significantly replace income um, that is provided by oil and gas. Qatar has looked at, um, you know, they, they have a, a small aluminum smelting industry. They're looking uh, to some degree at banking and financial services. The Emirates are looking at the same thing. So whether it's healthcare or education or tourism, it's an attempt to pull back at least a little from a dependence on oil and gas and generate other forms of income. I know Cleveland Clinic and Mayo both have hospitals there. In the Emirates, yes. In Saudi Arabia. Yeah, in Saudi Arabia. I know they have in Abu Dhabi and Dubai, yeah. And they're, you know, they're, those countries are also trying to develop their own tourism industry. So you, you um, see, particularly in Doha, the, um, an expansion of museums and other kind of cultural uh, institutions. Same thing with the Emirates. Um, kind of high-end hotels attracting a certain wealthy clientele. So that's another way that those countries are looking at diversifying the economy. Your attention, please. Oh. The library is closed in 30 minutes. Oh, dear. <laughs> including checkout and other computer services. Do, do we have time for one more question? Yeah. Yes, that's just a oh. half hour notice. OK. okay. So I, I can't, I'm not asking how many names, but some of the uh, leaders of these countries, how many of them were educated over here? Um, that's a that's a really interesting question, um, and I think increasingly you will see, certainly in Saudi Arabia, certainly in Qatar, to some degree the Emirates, um, very strong uh, ties between leadership and the U.S. educational system. But it's not even the leaders; it's it's you know kind of mid-level engineers. Um, Colorado School of Mines did really well educating Iraqi engineers in, in the 80s. Um, think of a US state institution that has a petroleum engineering program. They probably educated quite a few um, petroleum engineers, electrical engineers, chemical engineers, going back to these countries. Um, both the Emirates and Qatar have kind of taken a different spin on that now. And in, in Qatar, they have invited six U.S. institutions, Georgetown, Virginia Commonwealth, Carnegie Mellon, Texas A&M, uh, Cornell, and 
And I said, um, Northwestern. <laughs> so um, six units institutions set up shop, set up campuses uh, to educate primarily citizens of the country, but also the region. Um, New York University has a very large uh, presence in the Emirates. So it, it's kind of two-way street, if you will. Um, still increasingly, um, a lot of particularly um, children of the elites will go to the United States or the UK. Um, but increasingly, they're being sent to these campuses um, on the ground, so to speak. Well, when I went to school a long time ago, it was, I think it was called the brain dream. We educate them, mm. and then they go back. Um, but I mean, they, they in, in a way, that's Ivy you know, if, if you're being you know coldly rational, hopefully that's a good thing. You now have a number of people with U.S. educations and positions of power, hopefully predisposed to the to the country. Hopefully they had a good experience. They have really good educations. They're going to want them to use that education for the benefit of their country, but also maybe developing close relations with the United States. It's kind of the motivation for the, the Fulbright program, if you're familiar with that. I mean, how many Fulbright scholars have we hosted in this country that have gone back and become economic, political, cultural leaders in their home country? And in part, they achieved that influence because they had time in the United States. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions? Oh. And then I think, are you? Oh. Okay. I think both, so. Uh, my question was, uh, what they're stopping the education of women in many of those countries. What influence will that have with those younger people? Well, I, I, I think I would maybe challenge the, uh, the assumption that it's in a lot of the countries. Um, I actually think what you're, you're finding, again, I, I think of Qatar. I think of the Emirates. Um, incredible emphasis on educating young women and seeing them now going into positions of influence. I mean, I don't think we're going to see anyone as head of state yet. Um, Sheikh Tamim in Doha is pretty solidly there. His sisters, though, um, are incredibly well-educated. Duke, Georgetown, NYU, UCLA. And they're having you know, positions of influence in their country. Same thing with the Emirates. Um, I mean, I, I think it is certainly very concerning about Afghanistan, and and I think that is that is just devastating. What what is probably going to be happening in the next three to five years for uh, women there? But I, you, again, at at one point, forty percent of medical personnel in Afghanistan were women. I think that was the figure. Don't quote me exactly, but it, it was it was considerable since the fall of the Taliban. You know, how many women got educated in the medical sciences? So that's not going to go away. That expertise, that knowledge, that's not, you know, they can't take that away. So how it will find expression, that's what we're going to have to wait and see. And we still also need to support the next generation. Sorry. Because of the influence of oil, Mm -hmm. in that area, actually around the world. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there a compilation of re natural resources of all of the countries around the world, or in this area especially, when, when you think how that has driven? Speak into the mic. That has driven mm -hmm. uh, politics and wars, and so is there is there a compilation of that within those? Countries? You mean kind of an inventory of the the resources yes. under the ground? Yeah. I, um Interestingly enough, there are still reserves being discovered all the time, but it, you know, there, there's been a tremendous amount of 
effort. I mean, we, we see this um, because of British Petroleum. Uh, you know, they, they issue a, a highly regarded energy report every year. Um, we haven't talked about natural gas, but, you know, there are some countries in, in this region that are sitting on upwards of 100 years worth of, of natural gas. Yeah, people, maybe they don't have exact figures, but they're aware of the extent of, and they have a pretty good sense of where these reserves are and, and how much they are. So um, that, in part, back to the previous question about diversifying the economy, that in part is what's propelling some of these countries to say, you know what, even 266 billion barrels is going to run out at some point. And so we'll try to find more, but we're going to have to really pay attention to what happens when that spigot goes dry. So diversify the economy, create sovereign wealth funds, which you know, basically large bank accounts that company, uh, countries have that generate interest or other you know, uh, monies to use on projects. Um, fascinating to just look at how many of these countries have huge sovereign wealth funds, hundreds of billions of dollars. So they have oil in the ground, they have gas in the ground, but they also have these, these other assets that they're using to generate income. But they're paying very close attention to what they have under the ground. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? How do you know all that stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I read a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Um, no, it, this is an endlessly fascinating part of the world. And I've, my wife and I have been fortunate to live there for off and on for a number of, We've lived there off and on uh, uh, many parts of the world. We spent eight years in Doha, um, had foreign service postings in Baghdad, studied Arabic in Damascus. So, but... Um, yeah, we ignore this region at our peril, I would say. So it's frustrating. It can really, you know, pose challenges, but we, we cannot take our eye off this ball, I would say. On a scale of 1 to 10, what's your level of concern with Persian security? Persian Gulf security? Yeah. Um, I would probably put it around a, an 8. Um, a, because of those forces, those influences I was mentioning, but also I, I really think that our government is increasingly wanting to just distance itself from this region and deal with China, China. deal with Russia, um, deal with domestic issues. Um, I, all understandable. That's, I mean, you can make very compelling arguments to do that. But if we, I would say if we pull out completely or we just ignore what's happening in this region completely, um, we are really going to suffer long-term consequences. Okay. Sorry, don't mean to be so negative. <laughs> but thank you for coming.